Now, Chris Cotillo is here, covers the Red Sox from MassLive.com, joins us on the Volkswagen Dealers Expert Hotline. Chris, how you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? Excellent. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm sorry we were a little bit late, but we started talking about burgers. Um, you know how it goes. Yep. Um, you are no longer in Fort Myers, but you were in Fort Myers. I was, yeah. Now it's uh, it's weird not being near, you know, ten outback steakhouses in a four mile radius. But I'll, I'll live. <laughs> That's all right, because I hear we have a Gordon Ramsay restaurant in. Boston. That's very important. That's right. That's, That's your right. Judon. That's yes. right. Uh, how are things looking down there? Uh, there, there seems to be this uh, Paul cast over the Red Sox this year with lowered expectations. Now we have some injuries to deal with, and uh, the notion that uh, Alex Cora will not be here much longer. What is the mood around the team? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always tough to kind of gauge um, because from a player perspective, the fact they didn't add Jordan Montgomery, they didn't add Blake Snell or go out and get, you know, an ace or really add to the team as much as people thought means that, you know, the players themselves, a lot of the younger guys have a, a good opportunity. So if you're Tanner Houck or if you're, you know, Cooper Criswell, who's now in the rotation mix or Josh Winkowski or even Bobby Dahlbeck or some of these guys that, um, you know, are kind of uh, trying to prove themselves in the majors. Like they have an opportunity. And I think on a personal level, that's good for them and good for their careers. So it's not like any of those guys are sitting there lamenting the fact that they're not, um, you know, all in from a, just a selfish perspective. I don't say that in a bad way at all. Um, you know, I think with Cora, it's a little bit different. I think he's actually in a pretty good spot um, because no matter what happens, you can't really blame him for what happens this year with the roster they put in front of him. You know, he said in the Ken Rosenthal piece yesterday, um, kind of reiterating what he's told us right along that, you know, he could be looking at, you know, not even managing next year anywhere, managing elsewhere. So I do think, you know, the signs are pointing to him leaving, but um, I think in terms of competition, in terms of some of the things they're trying to do in spring training, like, you know, the, some of the competitions on backfields with PFPs, the fielding drills and, you know, catchers uh, kind of getting ranked on how many uh, balls they drop during drills and the pitching structure. Like a lot of that stuff seems to be improved and it seems to be a pretty smooth running camp. Of course, none of that matters uh, when the roster is not as good. The ownership commitment to winning isn't there. But, um, you know, spring training, I think the the big thing, anybody who has ever paid attention to spring training knows that you just want to get through it without a major catastrophic injury. They did not do that. They had probably, you know, one of the worst injuries you could possibly have for this team. You know, your big free agent addition going down with Giolito. So um, in that case, you have to look at kind of spring training as somewhat of a disaster just because of that one event. Um, but, you know, I think the the mood of the team, it's, it's again, I think it's opportunity because a lot of guys are going to have a chance to really make a name for themselves in the majors. And, you know, that's, I guess, the if there's a benefit within the clubhouse of not going full throttle, of course, that doesn't make anyone happy from the outside. With Giolito out, are they going to add from outside the organization or are they just like you kind of intimated, they're just going to move one of these middle relief swing guys to the starting rotation and keep going? Yeah, I mean, I think people saw that the other day and thought, oh, well, there is, you know, that's what's going to push John Henry to go get Jordan Montgomery. And like, you know, I, I do see the if A then B there, but if you reverse engineer it, it feels like it makes it less likely just because, John Henry didn't think this team was good enough to want to add to. That's something he has expressed privately to people that, you know, we're not there yet. And so I'm not willing to, you know, go past my budget. The budget's been set for months. Um, like that injury now means that instead of sinking, you know, 18, 19 million into that rotation spot, he'd be sinking, let's say Jordan Montgomery gets 25, you know, all of a sudden 45 million into a rotation spot, you know, and that's just one spot on a team of 26. And damn, I think, you know, they're worse than they were a few days ago and it makes even less sense to spend. You know, I do think every day that goes by where this guy's unsigned or Blake Snell is unsigned, I think, you know, Snell's a lot less likely because he has a draft pick attached, but every day that goes by with Montgomery unsigned, you know, the door, it has to be open just because the fit makes sense. And, you know, they've had talks and maybe the musical chairs works out. And so I, I can't rule it out a hundred percent. I just think that this is one of those things where, you know, it's not like Henry's looking at it and thinking we got to replace Giolito. Let's go get this guy. It's probably the reverse where he's saying 
we weren't good enough for me to invest before. Now we're even worse. Like, let's just, um, you know, give it up and, and he'll sign elsewhere. So, you know, a guy like Montgomery, I think the Rangers, maybe the Cardinals, you know, a Sonny Gray, a little bit hurt. Um, you know, it's a team that wanted to commit to trying to win. And, you know, Montgomery's been there before. Maybe the Angels. I don't know. Um, but I am, I think looking forward to him signing somewhere just because I think there is this kind of fans are still disillusioned thinking that he's going to come here. And, and I see why, I mean, he is on paper, a perfect fit. He's a guy that would fit this team. It's just, you know, where they think they are, even, you know, signing him to a longer term deal that they just, they don't see the match. Um, and they haven't been able to meet his asking price. And as others have pointed out, like Scott Boris now, you know, has all the leverage and, you know, can't, weighed out a discount you know if if, if giolito is out that's another reason yeah. you know to to put pressure on the red Sox, and they just they have not been willing to get to that ask price yet there is one piece of good news and as we've talked about it's the sahara desert for good news with this team uh, news kind of broke yesterday that they're close to a contract extension with brian bale 24 25 years old and like atlanta with spencer strider they're going to try and lock this kid up long term and an announcement could come as soon as this weekend that's some good news right yeah i mean i a couple weeks ago you know they went on such a kick talking about like we're trying to sign these guys to pre-arb extensions and we're trying to lock these young guys up early and all this stuff and so uh sean mcadam chris smith and i we were down there like decided to try to pull as many of the young guys as possible like hey have you had any contract extensions you know people are usually vague about it and so through a translator, I went up to Bayo and I was like, hey, uh, just 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 to ask, is an extension close? And he's like, yeah, more or less. Like, no. okay, <laughs> okay. You know, that's your like run up to the press box moment because <laughs> the guy actually, you know, said something or admitted to it. So by that point, it kind of became clear that, you know, they are uh, they were working with him. I think, you know, he's a, a good guy to do it just because. You know, he's not one of these guys that got a massive bonus. His bonus signing out of the Dominican was like 28000 You know, it wasn't a 2 or $3 million bonus, as you see some of these guys. Guy that, you know, like seems to like the organization. And as a pitcher, you know, to lock in that financial security is a good thing. And if it gets done, you know, I'm not, not sure of the terms yet, but, you know, might be buying out a free agent year or two where you get him in his theoretical prime at 29 or 30 for a reduced rate. You know, it could be somewhere 50 to $60 million And, you know, for all of the crap that they've gotten, and a lot of it's been from, you know, us on the beat because it's been a ridiculous way to go about the winter and the line to the fans and all that, all that good stuff. Like, this is actually what smart big market organizations do. Like, if this flops and he's not great, you know, 50 million, 60 million over six years isn't going to kill you as an organization. It's a good risk for the team. You know, he could be leaving a lot of money on the table um, by by doing a deal like this. So I think it's a it's it's a good step. And as I pointed out yesterday, somewhere like they, you know, the Braves do this all the time and other organizations, the Rays did this with a lot of guys, you know, uh, 10 years ago. The Red Sox have only done an extension with one guy with less than three years of service time since 2011 they did it with whitlock two years ago and it was kind of a similar situation where like he had a great rookie year as a rule five guy you know was willing to do it sign like 19 million guaranteed over four years with a couple of options they were able to lock him up you know they'd love to do this with casas and even you know less proven guys like willie abreu maybe rafaela how cutter crawford maybe you know von grissom even i know he hasn't played a game yet and it's hurt but like those are the kind of guys they're going to try to want to talk to. Who knows if they're going to play ball, but the fact that they're able to, you know, not quite done yet, but pretty close, get it with Bayo, I think is a good step because it's something that, you know, they obviously kind of saw what happens when you don't, when you have to, you know, pay out the nose for Devers a year away from free agency, when you have to trade Mookie, uh, when you have to, you know, go through the Bogart saga and some of these things like, uh, extending these guys early is very smart business, and it is good news for them. Yeah, that's what I was kind of focused on was the timing of it. You know, with with him being, you know, a couple of years out before he's even arbitration eligible, and they already have him under control for another what four years? I think it is. Um, yeah, you know, that's that's what kind of surprised me was that you know for a team that everybody looks at and goes. You know, they're cheaping out, they're not willing to pay, and now they're paying a guy that they don't have to pay rather than, you know, using that money to bring in somebody from the outside. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it, I think, you know, this year it'll come down to if they start the deal, 
you know, this year and the CBT hit kicks in, you know, they're not close to the CBT threshold. So I could see them doing that. Or if they, you know, sign him for the minimum or whatever, 720,000 this year, and then start the extension next year and kick the CBT situation down the road. I mean, I think the budget this year is probably, you know, to be looked at and, and John Henry real money. And he's not going to have to pay Brian Bayo, you know, 10, 12 million this year. He's going to pay him probably, you know, 700, 800,000, regardless of what this extension turns out to be. And you know, we've seen that a couple of places now, like Liam Hendricks deal because he's hurt. Um, it's, you know, a $5 million CBT hit and then the fake money over the next couple of years. But, He's only getting two million in real money this year, and if if you look at the budget that way, um, it makes a little bit more sense for where they've set it. I mean, we we've, we've said it time and time again. He has a real set hard cap budget for this year. He's shown no willingness to really move off of that. So even if the CBT number goes up a little bit, where you know uh, Bayo's deal pushes that up, it's not like it's really coming out of his pockets because uh, it's just spread out based on the average annual value. But again, smart business, and and they should be trying to do it with more players. And as I said, like, it's not the type of deal that can kill you. If Brian Bayo is, you know, in five years turns out to be a bust and you're, you know, you're going to have maybe, you know, 10, 11 million uh, or 12 million that you're paying him in one of those years, like, you know, to, to regular people, obviously that's a lot of money for them. It's, it's not, a killer contract when the payrolls are, you know, 200, 225 or the CBT levels, 240 million. Good grief. Yeah, I know. It just keeps going up. Uh, Chris Cotillo uh, covering the Red Sox from MassLive.com uh, has been joining us here on the Volkswagen Dealers Expert Hotline. Chris, thanks for the time. We appreciate it. Anytime, guys. Thanks.